Okay, well, ooh, wow. there you go. welcome to the October 5th, 2017 business meeting, and we're going to start with a roll call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we are joined this morning from County Council's office, uh, Mr. Stephen Madcor, and of course, uh, Mary Rathke, your clerk to the board. Uh, I will start with the uh, roll, and let me start first with uh, Commissioner Fisher, who is on the phone this morning. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Humberston? Here. Commissioner Schrader? Here. Commissioner Savas? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. And that was Don Krupp, our county administrator. First up is a presentation. Oh, oh. Pledge of Allegiance. Better put that in bigger letters. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Krupp, presentation. Yes, so we have a presentation to recognize educational and child care facilities which have attained 100% immunization rates. And so we have Lindsay Butler from our Health, Housing, and Human Services Department here to present this to you. Good morning, and thank you again, commissioners, uh, county administration, and also my leadership team, my director, Don Emmerich. Um, and H3S, uh, Deputy Director Jill Smith and Rich Swift for their support and opportunity to uh, bring this information to you today and share um, the presentation of our outst outstanding partners in prevention. So as um, Administrator uh, Krupp mentioned, we are here to recognize and honor that they have achieved 100% immunization rates in their child care facilities and or school, uh, public school, private school systems. So today we'll talk a little bit about why that's important from a public health standpoint and also honor their work. So before we get started on that piece, a little information about public health's role in immunization. Um, what we know is that, that immunization, interchangeable with vaccination, so if you hear the two words today, um, is one of the most successful and cost-effective public health initiatives in history. What we do is we use evidence-based information, so input from experts and the public, in order to create the best information we can to share with our public, our community, to keep them safe and to prevent the spread and incidence of preventable disease. Every day we do that by providing technical assistance to some of our primary care providers in, the, in our health systems and also in the community. Um, we identify, uh, help them identify ways and, and uh, to transport and handle the vaccines to keep them safe, as well as identify which vaccines to give to which person and at which time. It's a very complicated schedule, and so we provide that arm, if you will, to our providers, our primary care providers, to help them with that administration. One thing you may know is that our, one of our biggest roles is in public health to respond to disease outbreaks. And when we're doing our job, we don't have them <laughs> in terms of, of, of um, supporting immunization in schools and facilities for the community. Um, another piece, and why we're here today, is that, that schools and facilities have regulations to have students and children be immunize, immunized within the school, and that's to provide a healthy and safe environment um, free of, of preventable disease uh, so that our children and families are safe. In 2015, um, a uh, law was passed, Senate bill was passed, requiring schools to post the vac vaccination and immunization rates. The reason that this is important is that it allows parents to have full disclosure of, of that when they're making a choice for their children to be enrolled in a child care facility or school. Some may lean towards the schools that are very vaccinated, and some may choose a school that is more in tune with their value if they choose not to. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, oh. there we go. So it is public health standpoint that it is our role with immunization services to keep our children safe. It starts with the children, of course that they grow into adults, and so that carries over. And in prevention, in Oregon, we have, that means we have over 1,800 schools with about 600,000 students. 
to prevent disease and keep healthy and safe. In Clackamas County, we have 119 public schools, 31 private, and two online schools. Adding to that responsibility are the 154 um, child care facilities. Everybody that participates in our vaccination and immunization efforts helps to de decrease the vaccine preventable diseases, keeping our population safe. There are, it's not just keeping the individual safe, the individual child, it's also looking at vulnerable populations who cannot immunize, even if they want to. There are babies that aren't of age yet to immunize. There are children, there are adults who have diseases such as cancer, where you're not able to, to accept an, or have an, an immunization. And also, our elderly population fall into the vulnerable category as well, and so we serve and want to protect everybody. We also look at the fiscal impact, as that is an important piece of this puzzle. Why do we immunize? Why do we promote this service? Well, there's a direct savings estimated at about $9.9 .9 billion in healthcare savings. And when I say direct, I mean caring for an ill child. So a child that has mumps, if you will. And 33.4 billion healthcare savings in indirect costs. Savings in um, responding to outbreaks. For example, in public health, it's estimated that if an outbreak to, were to occur, it would be about $10,000 per day um, in labor and staff and time. An outbreak can be upwards of 18 days. That's a pretty hefty price tag. And finally, there are federal programs that also support immunizations, other federal programs, partners, if you will. The Vaccines for Children program was in initiated to help those families that cannot pay uh, or may not be able to pay for immunizations be able to have them for free and at no cost. In WIC, we screen for immunizations for, that, for the first two years of life, as that is a very crucial time for our families to have the information they need to make those choices. And then in academia, you see much of the research that goes along with our information, our evidence-based practice occurs in academia and is supported by universities. So what does that look like in Clackamas County? In 2017, you can see this, is, this, this graph is for um, kindergarten through 12th graders and it lists the various vaccination rates. Overall, we're at about 96%, which is really good. For our, for our child care facilities, preschool aged, about 82%. It's a di more difficult population to attain that immunization rate, high immunization rate. State, state law wants us at above 90%, 95%. So what happens for those that choose not to or cannot um, vaccinate or immunize their, their children? There are two opportunities um, to become exempt, and one is medical exemption, and that is where the, we talked about a, a healthcare condition that would um, prevent an immunization, and that accounts for about 0.1% of all the exemptions um, in Oregon. Non-medical exemption is another way, it is a more popular way in Oregon, as you see 4.7% um, exemptions occur um, and are uh, classified as non-medical. This allows parents to decline some or all of the immunizations for the child, keeping in mind here that if they choose to do so, they, their child may be excluded from school should an outbreak occur. It will, re, could result in lost educational opportunities. Recent um, legislation has supported this, the immunization efforts and the exclusion efforts uh, to decrease those non-medical exemptions. In 2013, it was noted, it was found that um, for our kindergarten students, we had, Oregon had the highest non-medical exemption rate. And so legislation um, was passed um, supporting the regulations around that. And you can see on this graph the impact there. So in 2015, which is the first year after implementation, that there was a significant dip in non-medical exemptions. And now you'll see a slight uptick. So there's emerging trends now we see with pertussis, whooping cough, that are starting to creep back in. As public health uh, officials, that's a, that's a concern and a priority for us. Um, I mentioned that in Clackamas County, we're above 95%, that state requirement. However, when you look more granularly, more at, at the pockets that we have here, you see that five of the seven facilities and schools with the highest non-medical exemption rates in our, our Portland metropolitan region 
five of s seven of those are right here in Clackamas County. So we have a great opportunity to provide that information to those populations, to encourage them to engage and learn, and ultimately still leave that choice up to them. But it is an opportunity for us to um, work with our public on that um, number. Um, so at this point, I'd like to take an opportunity for any questions or comments um, and pause for a moment before we move through through the rest of the presentation. Okay, Ken. Just one question, what is the most common non-medical excuse for not uh, immunizing your children? Do you mind if I call upon my staff for that, that question? Fine with me. Kathy? Okay. You have to come up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy, this is Kathy Thompson, and she's one of the coordinators for our immunization program. Thank you for that. Thank you, Kathy. Um, that reason is not documented. The, um, they can take anything they want. It used to be a religious exemption, and <clears throat> excuse me, so we assume that most of them are religious in nature, the reasons, but um, there were so many philosophical exemptions that they went, um, that they don't even ask the reason, so that's not documented. Does that answer that? And I but, but it would strike me that it may, would make it then difficult to um, work with people to convince them that it might make, they might make a better decision. Yeah. If and you don't know the reason why, how do you, how do you, um, how do you have that discussion with them? And that's a great point, which is why we call this an opportunity to be able to, if we have those connections to some of those schools and public health is able to form the connections with their parents, families that are making those decisions as well as the children, we have that opportunity to share that the information that we have as well as ask some very uh, pointed questions that can help them think about it and learn from their own um, um, education and sources, um, as we know, and those decisions that are very personal and individual, um, there isn't an, a way to force or even isn't our desire to force that, so. How long has public health been in existence in Clackamas County? Hmm. The reason I ask is, you know, when we were kids, polio, yep. uh, we had the entire community went to Milwaukee High School and got, I think, sugar cubes at one point. Then there was that gun, which we many have scars mm -hmm. on our arms from. And, and I think those were the two ways they delivered that back then. But that was really something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember yep. probably a half mile line to get into Milwaukee High School at that when I was a kid. Wow, that's incredible. And you bring up a great you know, disease prevalence if you think about the incidence of, of polio now. It's important to continue to share the information and allow families to make that individual choice. But really our role in public health is to, when that individual, cho individual choice is made, not to immunize, immunize, to help that family as best as possible in protecting them should an incidence occur in their school. Yeah, the Rotary organization had almost eliminated polio in the world. Well, yes, and in fact, uh, yesterday, at yesterday's Rotary Club, there was some discussion about that, and that in the course of the past year, there were only 10 cases worldwide reported wow. of polio. Wow. One of the, uh, if you've been watching the Ken Burns Vietnam thing, a lot of the children who were uh, left behind, a lot of those children had polio in Vietnam. Uh, and because obviously they didn't have the kind of things we have now with our public health department. Uh, Commissioner Schrader. I re actually remember the first measles vaccine as well. Was there a measles vaccine? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that was, measles, that was unique. I remember the polio, mm -hmm. the measles. And uh, my parents were both RNs, were registered nurses, so they would often give us the shots. I don't know if they can, you could do that today if your parents were healthcare professionals, but I remember right. actually being immunized by my parents wow. because my mother worked for the local, you know, our family doctor, so she, he just said, here. Yeah, I, well, needles, that needles was scary. Our school would <laughs> empty, <laughs> you know, everyone would be home sick, the entire family would be <laughs> sick. All right. Well, okay. Great. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, 
So at this point, I would like to um, move on to the honor part of this presentation. And I would like to present to you Clackamas County's outstanding partners in school law. And I say school law directly is our function here in terms of the exclusion um, and the ability for these, these, these um, facilities and schools to achieve 100% immunization rates. We have some in the room here, and I, I do have a list of K through 12. You can see some highlighted here. Uh, we do have Timberlake Job Corps here. Brian Yates, is that right? Yeah, thank you for being here. Congratulations. Others in the community. Um, we have the Eagles Clubhouse. Eagles Clubhouse today. Uh, Kinder Care, Lake Grove. All right, thank you guys for being here. Congratulations. And then we have, um, oopsie, I'm sorry, one more. Um, we have these, the pre-K ones here as well, and um, Vicki Bellicosa Child Care. She is here today and is going to provide a little testimony today to, to help you understand why it is important for her um, to achieve these rates as well. So I'd like to introduce to you today and test, hear testimony from Vicki Bellicosa. Please come on up. Yeah, please uh, give us your name and where you live, the area. Oh, um, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I don't really know, well, first of all, my name is Vicki Bellicosa, and I am the owner and operator of Vicki Bellicosa Child Care. Is this okay? Okay. Um, I've lived in Clackamas County my whole life. Um, uh, actually, just down the street here a little bit as an elementary student, for a few years, but primarily in Estacada. Um, I, uh, I don't really know why it's important to me. I never really looked at it that way until this program. And I don't know if it's important to me or as it's common sense. Um, I realize we all have our rights to whatever we all want to believe. Um, I have not had too much opposition in it or a pushback in as far as the daycare arena. It's always kind of been, you know, so-and-so is going to the doctor today and they're probably gonna get shots. And, and so we kind of started celebrating that as far as, you know, oh, Jack's got his shots today. I'll use my son as an example. Jack's got his shots today. So we have to be careful because he has the band-aids on his legs or his arms or whatever. So he's gonna pick snack for us today you know, something like that, so that they get some sort of something from it. Um, wasn't really intentional, more as just a compassion type thing. Um, I have got pushback. I'm very, my kids were very involved in sports and um, at the youth and high school level. And there'd be the occasional mom or dad that would, why on earth would you support that? Why on earth wouldn't you? It's kind of common sense. Remember, while we all learned how to drive at one point. Mom and dad didn't just throw the keys at us and say, best of luck, hope you come home this afternoon. You know, we were taught, we were educated, and, and then we were given the freedom to do whatever. This is kind of that same thing on a different scale. Why would you not have your child most prepared for the rest of their life? Um, we did have a bit of a whooping cough outbreak last fall. Um, and quite frankly, I felt like it was appalling. Um, again, my, my mother shares your polio story. Um, she grew up in Maine. I remember the first time I saw that, oh my gosh, what happened to you? Um, and she said it was a shot. And I remember, I don't even know how old I was, but I remember going, Man, your doctor's mean. <laughs> my doctor doesn't do that. <laughs> um, and you know, it's, this isn't like a peanut allergy. This is something that is 100% preventable. There's just no excuse for it. Um, and you, as a parent, have the responsibility to take care of that for someone that doesn't have the opportunity until they're much older. Um, that's kind of my input on it. So I just, you know, parents ask me, and I just go, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Don't buy into the hype of, of you know, so-and-so or whatever. You're the parent. It's your responsibility. 
Great. Good. Yeah. Commissioner Schrader. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. No. Oh. This was left on. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate that. And that reminds me of a story that Kathy <coughs> told me in her work. She feels very passionately about immunizing herself because she works with the very vulnerable populations that Vicki's talking about, the, the babies that can't be immunized and some of those folks in the healthcare system that have diseases that cannot be. So thank you for sharing that message today. And thank you guys again for your time um, and celebration of our, of our immunization services and preventive, pre preventative services in public health. If you guys do have some more questions or would like some more information. Well, you like might have a comment. One thing oh. is uh, that um, I noticed that there was a notice in my email today about free flu shots going on. Do you have any information on that? So we, public health does not organize the flu shots, um, but the health, the health centers, if I'm correct, the health centers does. And I know that that is happening now. Um, Don or Jill, do you guys have more information on the scheduling? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Pardon? I don't with me, but I yeah. find it very appropriate. I had my Walgreens uh, provides, I mean, there's a certain number of vouchers available, and then most insurances cover the, the complete shot. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can find that out, maybe next our next meeting. Uh, Jim, what you saw was probably through open enrollment. They're going to offer flu shots during the open enrollment program. No, I saw a Walgreens. Oh, okay. There was a Walgreens uh, thing that came in my email today. I didn't bring my phone because we agreed not to look at them, so I, <laughs> I didn't bring it to look. And we will get that information for you. I know that the county, we, we have some in-house, too, so that all of our folks get immunized as well. So, But we'll Great. get that for you, certainly. And our uh, Commissioner Shre uh, Sonia Fisher is on the phone and had a question. Hi, Commissioner Fisher. Commissioner, are you there? Hmm. <coughs> Sounds like we may have not. We may have lost her. Technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. We have a photo op, correct? Yes. So all those. Whoever you right. like to write up. No, Thank you very much. Oh, Sonia, are, the, are you there? Hello? Yes. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Well, why don't you guys come down and do the photo? <laughs> okay. We'll do the photo, and if she connects, we'll ask the photo. All right. Who do you want to write, write up? I would like to invite up the Emmys team and, the, and the, the facilities that are here today. Don and Jill, if you would be a part as well. We must have lost you. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. 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 I'll let you know that. It's <laughs> okay. They're taking a picture right now. You want to talk to Don? He's sitting right here. Don, you want to talk to him? Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. So I'll, I'll I'll pull that up when when we get to the consent agenda, and you want okay. to ask your question about it at that I'll time. Oh, ask Sonia if she had a question. Yeah, ask okay. 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 Well, the next item on the agenda. Thank you all very much for attending. You have to stay till we end at three o'clock today. <laughs> You're, welcome to, You're welcome to go. No, don't hang up. Oh, make and, you stay. Uh, no. uh, up. Les Poole, got your blue card. Come on up. Good morning, Commissioners. And Sonia, even though you're probably not on the phone. No, she hung up again. We'll get her back. We'll get her back. 
Um, yeah, great presentation. Oh, okay. uh, up again. <laughs> that, that was a good presentation. Okay. And uh, that's okay. No, the numbers um, so are pretty interesting. And I, I was not quite Sound old yet. enough okay. for the needles. I remember being a little kid scared to death of it. <laughs> and the first time I got my vaccination was the sugar cube thing. And I thought vaccine, oh, yeah, this is fine. Right. Next thing you know, they're poking you with a gun. Um, <laughs> And interestingly, I, I've, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in vaccines that have a long-term effect. The jury's still out. The jury is still out on the, the flu vaccine. We're, we're chasing a mutating virus. We're making it stronger. Eh, I've never had one. So obviously, if I ever get the flu, though, the first thing I need to do is remove myself from the crowd. We can't send our kids to school if we think they're coming down with something. They're coming down with something. They already got it. So, uh, um, big supporter of vaccines, but I, I'm one of the many people that wasn't on the list that says, "Well, these folks here aren't participating in flu vaccines." So, a couple of it, quick things. I don't think it listed the people. Yeah. It listed yeah. the percentage because that would be the exactly. Concern. And and I'm just here to say that uh, by all means, I support <coughs> most of what I heard there. Absolutely. Um, a couple of quick things. We used to have evening meetings on the third Thursday of the month. I don't know how many signatures I'm going to have to gather to get that back next year, but we'll, we'll get working on that someday. Um, the commission's real busy. It's not like they decided to take that night off. We, we now have a, a board meeting for the Parks District in that slot. And... Um, you probably know that there's a lot of angst about access to a, a private property on the trolley trail. I'm sure you're probably hearing about it both as commissioners and as the parks board, leaders of the parks board. You wear a couple hats. So I, I'm, I'm not here to, to start a giant conversation about it, but there's some angst about how it was handled. and. I, the, the reason I'm bringing it up is that this reminds me of too many things I've seen in the past where code enforcement uh, gets, for lack of a better description, over the top. And we still have a problem there. And hopefully um, things can be worked out. And uh, I'm not here to comment on the specifics of the issue. Uh, if, I were, if I were to do that, the right place for that would be this evening. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say real briefly is that uh, I, I am, like all of you, a, lo a lot of folks aren't even talking about what happened in Vegas. You know, that happened. Monday morning I went to DMV. I wanted to be there early. There's 30 people in line. Everybody's texting. Nobody says a word. Nobody says a word. And, and not that when you're in line with strangers at DMV, we should all be talking about it. But it's so easy to decide that we're going to come up with a new law or government's going to come up with a solution for, for social ills. And I just want everyone to know that I'm sure behind the scenes we're all talking about it. And we all need to, we all need to somehow find a way to recognize when somebody's off the deep end. They all have certain things in common. And uh, uh, instead of saying, gee, I never talked to him, or he was quiet, or he kept to himself, that's what you say to the public. But what you're really thinking is, that guy gives me the friggin' creeps, and I'm not going to say anything. And we got to start saying something. The family members always know, or they have a hunch, and if we can't stop this ahead of time, cleaning up the mess afterwards is not doable. And I commend AMR for their amazing response. Uh, I personally had an experience with, with, a, with a neighbor that was exceptional in how they handled someone that was injured. Um, I've had experience in the past with them. Their communications director was there that day. And he's one of those responders that went towards the danger instead of from it. Another company's going to be awfully hard-pressed to ever replace AMR in this county. 
Thanks for all your time. Thanks. We won't be looking at another ambulance company taking the place of AMR as long as I'm here, I'll tell you that. Um, but there also is some programs that people ought to look at. For example, the county has a mental health first aid program. Um, and it, it's a way to identify people that might, um, will have mental health issues, but uh, it's not always possible to identify it. And I, I think in this case, from everything I've heard, uh, it was very difficult to identify that this gentleman would do this. Um, but um, anyway, uh, mental health first aid is a program that I think you'll see grow. Um, I took it. It's a very valuable program. I know other, other fo a lot of people at the county took that class. So hopefully that'll expand and more and more people will look at uh, taking that class along with CPR and all the other important classes that are available. All right, with that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Yes. I look like you're gonna say something. Well, you have something to read first. I have something to read? <coughs> yes, so we, we have a, um, an amendment. Oh, uh, oh okay, I thought Don agenda. was reading that, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we have, it's a revision to the agenda uh, before us today, and I just wanted to quickly uh, speak to it uh, it's, uh, it's an item that involves a, the approval of a contract with trench line excavation for the construction of utility lines in 115th Avenue. Uh, they, it's the 115th Avenue utility line extension project. And the reason this is being added to your agenda today is, is because we, we could have put it on for next week, but this contractor is ready to proceed uh, next week. And this is the uh, set of utility lines that will serve our veterans transitional shelter site. So we uh, put it on the agenda today for you to act on so the contractor can get started with the work next week. So I had a question on this one because the amount's quite high and I wanted to make sure that's not the only uh, reason we're bringing the sewer pipe down the road, and it is not. So it means that the property in the area is going to be permanently served when it is not now for uh, any future uses of the sites. Yeah. Not only that site, but the sites surrounding it. Correct. So, because that's a lot of money. <laughs> All right. Okay, today's, uh, today's consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of amendment number one to sub-recipient grant agreement 17-027 with folk time for peer directed mental health support services in Clackamas County. Approval of amendment number one to the intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon acting by and through its Oregon Health Authority for operation as the local public health authority for Clackamas County. Um, under the Department of Transportation and Development approval to apply for the local bridge program grant through the Oregon Department of Transportation and approval of a contract with HDR Engineering for design engineering services for the Boardman Creek Fish Habitat Restoration Project under elected officials approval of previous business meeting minutes and approval of the Clackamas County Investment Policy that's through our treasurer's office under the Department of Disaster Management, approval of amendment number four to subrecipient grant agreement 16-023 with the Department of Forestry, North Cascades District for fire prevention coordination and approval of an intergovernmental funding agreement with Oregon State Police, Office of State Fire Marshal. Under Business and Community Services, approval of a contract amendment with Mackenzie Engineering for the Clackamas County Employment Lands Assessment Program. And under the Development Agency, this is the item that we added to the agenda, approval of a contract with trench line excavation for construction of the 115th Avenue Utility Line Extension Project. And that concludes today's consent agenda. Does any commissioner want to remove or pull an item from the consent agenda? So, Mr. Chair, uh, I did receive a uh, request from Commissioner Fisher. She asked if I would introduce this uh, on her behalf, just given the communication between the phone lines, uh, okay. that she had a, she just wanted to have more information provided 
about uh, it's uh, it's item a2 on the uh, agenda the approval of the amendment number one to the intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon uh, acting by and through its Oregon Health Authority for operation as local public health authority for Clackamas County what uh, what this is is, is it's, it's really the first amendment of the of the current fiscal year uh, related to our omnibus agreement uh, that uh, ha has uh, uh, state uh, funding and support through the Oregon uh, Health Authority for the various things that we do uh, in Clackamas County with respect to public health. And in particular what this does is it increases the uh, funding support for our uh, women, infants, children program by uh, a little over $34,000. Uh, and then also uh, adds funding to our school-based uh, health centers uh, services uh, related to providing mental health services to the tune of about $336,700. That brings the total contract uh, value up to $2,607,302. And so she asked that I share that with you. So this is additional money coming from the state for these various departments. Correct. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, has no impact on our general fund. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Any, let's see where we're at here. So are we okay to, I'll uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the consent agenda. As amended. As amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as amended. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. It's 5-0. I, I said yesterday what we need is a picture of the person. I put, put my picture on the wall in Ken's office, see if he notices it, the one I would use. Anyway, uh, motion carries 5-0. Uh, County Administrator updates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of uh, items to share with you. First, uh, I am happy to relay to you a really positive report from our septic on-site wastewater team uh, in the Department of Transportation and Development. Uh, a while back, we had recognized that the team was uh, dealing with issues related to delays and being able to respond to septic site uh, permitting requests. And of course, they've been working to uh, properly staff and retool up the program. Uh, just about two to three months ago, customers who were seeking a uh, septic site evaluation were given an expected turnaround of uh, about 12 weeks. Uh, about a month or so ago, we were able to reduce this estimate to 10 weeks. And now just this last week, we've been able to give our new customers an estimate of seven weeks. So uh, supervisors have told me that the, uh, the crew is cranking uh, to get through these inspections. And so I think it's important to keep in mind over the past year, this group has experienced the highest permitting volume it has ever seen. And they've still been able to accomplish these business process uh, improvements. At the same time, they've been dealing with changes in turnover with staff and employees. So I just wanted to give a good shout out to our uh, septic team uh, for increasing their efficiency and improving uh, customer service, uh, certainly part of our core values here in Clackamas County. Uh, the other item I wanted to share with you is that we had our um, second Hound Me Downs garage sale. It was held a couple of weeks back. Uh, this, uh, they, I didn't write this, they did. Uh, this Howling Good Time is put on by the Clackamas Dogs Foundation for the benefit of Clackamas Dog Services. The annual uh, garage sale sees uh, gently used dog beds, leashes, bowls, toys, and clothing uh, sold to, to interested parties, and we managed to raise about $1,800 that will support our dog services programs, uh, including the uh, emergency vet program and the low income spay and neuter program. So uh, uh, thanks to the Clackamas Dogs Foundation for continuing to raise the wolf with their efforts. <laughs> And that's it. To the dog of the week As now. It's not enough. <laughs> I think it's really bad. It was the dog of the week. Uh, on to Commissioner <coughs> Communication, and first up is Commissioner Fisher. 
Good morning from sunny Southern California. Just a few things. I've really appreciated the flexibility of everyone to allow me to participate in all of our um, work sessions, policy sessions. It's um, wonderful to be able to support family and also continue to do the good work in Clackamas County. Just because I'm out of our normal world in Clackamas County and in Southern California, I just want to let you know just a few things that have been on my mind. Uh, first and foremost, our transportation. We had the planning work session yesterday, and being down here, just the the process of walking from where my daughter lives down a busy street to a reservoir is quite hectic, and it brings to mind the importance of having us all work diligently to protect our quality of life. I know that yesterday we were looking at the possible priorities for um, ex possible extra funding with bonding, and we were all sort of coalescing around the sunrise. Phase two, and then after taking a walk this morning, I just had to think, wow, if we really want to move something forward with a bond, I'm kind of now of the mind of Chair Bernard saying, we want to do something that passes. And when you're walking and living in certain neighborhoods, getting more into the core of our everyday lives and protecting our quality of life of how we live is really important. And I can say it's challenging here. It's, it's different than it is home, and it's challenging. So that's on my mind. And then the next thing that's really been on my mind, so I have a grandson who is just a week old. He's the second grandson. He's got a big brother, Augie, who's two and a half. And these two children are just so precious, and it just brings to mind the important responsibility we have of protecting our, our natural resources, protecting our environment, and just the fragility of all of us. And we saw that really clearly with the wildfires a few weeks ago of how it was difficult to breathe. I'm forever reminded of looking at these precious, fragile children and the huge responsibility that we all have to protect the future for our children and future generations. So those are the things that I'm thinking while here in California. Thank you so much to my colleagues for answering my emails, responding to my texts, and keeping us moving forward. I so appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. Next up is Commissioner Schrader. Well, I kind of feel like I'm uh, on, on the road quite a bit, actually. The uh, past few weeks have been really busy as second vice president of our statewide association colleagues. Um, I visited three of our larger districts, District 1, 2, and 3, which includes Morrow, Prineville, Enterprise, Joseph, where I had an opportunity to meet with our colleagues across the state about the issues that they are dealing with in their localities. And what it what has really uh, shown me is that, yes, there are quite uh, Quite a big difference between urban and rural issues. I explained the other day in a meeting that while here we may have issues with uh, cougars up in Estacada, kind of eating dogs and cats out in, uh, in the far reaches of Wallawa County, they have uh, issues with wolves uh, eating livestock. So it's, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition to see uh, what we're dealing with and what rises to the top. Uh, as, as counties, and I will continue to do that work. Uh, I'm also uh, tomorrow heading out down to the association. We're going to be having our housing and uh, homeless, housing and homelessness or houselessness meeting. We're beginning an initiative with the uh, state um, Oregon and Housing Community Services to see what we can do, not just as Clackamas County, but counties as a whole, uh, to feed into their initiative of basically dealing with the housing crisis across the state. I had an opportunity also yesterday to meet with uh, Diane Lynn, an old friend. She uh, works for, is the executive director of Proud Ground, and they are basically focusing on 
workforce housing. And this is what folks have to remember. It's a continuum of folks that need subsidized housing to those folks that maybe with a little bit of bridge funding can actually begin to afford their own homes. And that's the demographic that Proud Ground uh, works with. So we talked a little bit about community land trusts and what that might mean uh, for Clackamas County as well. Um, at the national level, Okay, um, basically I've re gotten my seat back as chair of the Economic Development Subcommittee and what we do there is look at national impacts on what, uh, what those policies, national policies are doing with, with county. We continue to uh, lobby very hard for CDBG funds and particularly for workforce funding so we can get dollars here in our state and in our workforce initiative here in Clackamas County to get people skilled up and trained up. Uh, I'm still following, continuing to track the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation uh, Initiative in Scapoose and I'm working with our local community college, Clackamas Community College, to see how that would inform what they're doing with their groundbreaking now where they are building a new uh, manufacturing technology center and training and how they would also collaborate, collaborate and integrate what they're doing with uh, Oregon Tech here in uh, Clackamas County, which is located in Wilsonville. So a lot of really exciting workforce training initiatives there um, that we're working on here. Um, finally, um, last night, can, can, uh, Commissioner Humbertston and I had the uh, opportunity to uh, attend the Main Street Conference Awards Banquet, um, and we uh, had a chance to visit with Mary Obrist and uh, Governor Ted Kulongowski who sat at our table. And First Lady Barry Obrist was uh, actually essential back in the early 2000s to implement the Main Street program across the state of Oregon. And many of our cities with our economic development group hopped onto that, including Oregon City, uh, Estacada, Sandy, um, Gladstone did. We hope they can reinvigorate that, but it is actually a very fine economic development tool for our local rural and urban communities where they want to revitalize their downtown, keep their businesses there, and also maintain the character of the downtown and the community. So Mary won an award uh, for all our first lady, former first lady, for all her hard work, and it was delightful to see them again. Um, other than that, uh, let's go to the arts and culture activities in the county. Hola Art Reception. Meet the incredible artists and see their artwork currently on display in a special Arts Alliance artist exhibit program exhibit in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Thursday, October 5th, that's today, 4.30 uh, to 5.30 in the Public Services Building Lobby in Oregon City. So that's downstairs, folks. Artist Reception, Water and Form by Emily Miller. Emily Miller's Water and Form is inspired by an intimate study of our local coasts and wetlands, reflecting and responding to place and space. Emily will present work in media from clay to fiber and wax. Friday, October 6th, 5 to 7 p.m. at 510 Museum and Art Space in Lake Oswego. And for more information, go to clackmasartsalliance.org. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Savas. Well, it just so happened that the last three Mondays, uh, I have been um, attending conferences and seminars related to housing, and at each of those, um, what's come out is sessions and more and more focus on the ills of some of the consequences that are leading to just housing. So I think people are wising up uh, to what's going on. So the issues of gentrification um, and displacement are front and center. And, um, you know, I, when you talk about quality of life and you see some of these people passionately uh, talking about what's taking place in their neighborhoods, um, and Portland has a lot of history, there's a lot of case studies and a great examples of what's going on today, what's had in the recent past, mm -hmm. and a number of those community members were, um, became activists and formed organizations and groups in which they have, uh, are tackling this. And, um, you know, a light went off. I was kind of refreshing on Monday, late Monday, when I realized that the work that we did um, here in Clackamas County 
uh, the citizen group MAP, McLaughlin Area Plan, back in 2009, 10, and 11, and that work that was done, that the conclusions we came to then are the very conclusions that these groups are coming with up today. And I know that before us at the beginning of every year is our work plan and the work plan request, the repeating request, um, has been to work on our zoning, work on looking at overlays to protect neighborhoods and so forth, which is precisely where a number of these folks are in Portland are saying they want to have, and they realize that that means changes to their comprehensive plan. Yep, they're right. Uh, they, they know that the elected leadership needs to get behind that. Yes, they know that had they done that earlier on, that they wouldn't be in the predicament they're in today. And it's the very same thing. So they've come and wised up to the very same conclusions that we have in our community. Um, they haven't gotten a lot of traction with their elected jurisdictions, uh, elected leaders, and nor have we here or they here. I'm wearing two hats. I mean, one as a citizen who was part of that, who believes in that, and one as a commissioner who believes we should make that happen and facilitate that. But we keep on dragging our feet and a lot of bad things happen to the community and they're quite upset. And it affects our quality of life, it affects transportation, it, it exacerbates homelessness, exacerbates poverty, and we keep on accommodating things that exacerbate the problem and don't really build the jobs and, and lead to prosperity, which is, which is, I think, really fundamental. So, you know, I, it was, uh, I take to heart that these, some of these people say, you know, I used to live over in this neighborhood, and I, I think about their plight. It was, I, it was very, <laughs> some very touching conversations when people say, um, or express that they live there, they want to still go back to where they live, but they can't afford to do that. And it's got to be somewhat humiliating to realize that you got forced out of your neighborhood because you simply didn't have the means or the, the income um, to afford that. That's kind of humiliating. If you really think about that, it's demoralizing. And there's also a lot of resent and a lot of passion expressed. And, and I think that that's something that we need to be aware of as these growth pressures are are uh, impacting residents in Clackamas County as well. So I don't want to see that duplicated here, and we need to get ahead of it. Um, I'll close with that. I'll, I'll, I'll close with that today. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Humberston. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like to respond to uh, Mr. Krupp's comment about our septic folks. Uh, I had the unpleasant opportunity to put in a new septic tank. However, I must say that the, um, the folks in our department uh, dealt with the contractor very quickly and efficiently and effectively and, and got a messy job done pretty, pretty quickly. So I was very pleased myself. So I saw firsthand how well they're doing and uh, it was appreciated. Um, hey. It was interesting that uh, Commissioner Schrader commented on Wallowa County and what what some of the problems are that uh, the folks out there that are cattle ranchers, Wallowa. Wallowa. I, I keep going back and forth on that one. <laughs> it's like um, One of the new um, commissioners out there is a cattle rancher, and I got to meet him at the AOC conference, and he shared information with me about some of the problems they have with wolf kills on the on cattle. And so I had a meeting today, fortuitously, with our county trapper. And I got a chance to, to learn a little bit more about how that system works. And one of their issues that I hope maybe we can help them with, because in the future I'd like to see them help us with some of our issues, is if there is a kill by a wolf, they call the local trapper. But before he can do anything, it has to go through three or four bureaucratic steps in Salem by people who know nothing about cattle ranching and who are not out there. Now, I, know, I believe that their hearts are in the right place, and I very much support the idea of maintaining a healthy wolf population, but I also know the cattle ranchers don't raise cattle to feed wolves. They raise cattle to feed us. And uh, maybe at some point we may be able to help those folks address this so that the guy on the ground who is the professional has an opportunity to make a professional decision as to what needs to be done and how it needs to be done rather than having to go from Wallawa 
County to Salem and back. <clears throat> so it was just kind of a fortuitous yeah. situation for, for us today. Um, I, I attended the uh, Sustainable Northwest um, Gala the other night, and the Gala had a panel, and the panel was on CLT discussion. And I know some of you have heard this already because we mentioned it on Tuesday. But we did have the opportunity to have dinner with a gentleman from Katerra who is building a CLT plant in Spokane. And I've shared that information in his card with our team. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a conversation with those folks about what might be possible here in Clackamas County. And our discussions with um, the environmental community uh, are going well so far. Um, we have qualified support for what we want to do. And um, some of the next steps will include them again in terms of standards that they, they would like to see applied, as well as working with the Forest Service and Timber folks to uh, put this program together. Um, the Fair Board is working on the agreement, and I've been told by their president they'll uh, try and have this completed by the end of this month. And I had a casual conversation with one of their other members, because he lives three doors down from me, and uh, reiterated our concern on that. and. Uh, he seemed to get the message. So I think we'll have that finally put to bed in the very near future. And I did offer that if they have questions that they are not comfortable with, to, I would set up a meeting with the chair, yourself, myself, them, and county council, and get their questions answered. So uh, the avenue is there to get it taken care of. And uh, finally, this Saturday um, in Milwaukee is the Willamette River cleanup. I intend to be there to help take stuff out of the boats and throw it in the trash and whatnot like that, and anybody else that wants to participate, show up in Milwaukee and uh, help clean up the river. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The dog. <laughs> the dog. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Good golly, come meet Miss Molly. She's a young, lively American pit bull terrier who would do best with folks who know and love her breed. A secure yard with a high fence is a must for her since there's lots of spring in her legs. Obedience training would help her bond with her new people and help to gain confidence. Once Molly gets to know you, she'll want to be with you all the time, playing together, taking long walks, running, even learning new active games. Come meet soon and get the adoption process started. She needs a home with no other pets and children over nine years old. For more information about Molly and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503 655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you. Great, thank you. Last night I had the opportunity to talk trash up at Rose Villa. Uh, Metro's uh, discussion with the community about how to reduce uh, landfill, uh, the use of landfills uh, and how to you know, it costs a lot of money to drive a truck over to Eastern Oregon, and there's a lot of them. Um, and that deals with packaging and stuff like that. It was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, they're definitely uh, working to get a more diverse group of people talking. There were a lot of Russians there and translators uh, translating what was being discussed. And it was very interesting. I'd never seen that before. Um, as far as the Main Street program, I used to be the president of Milwaukee Downtown Association. I attended the Main Street program. It was very good. It was it's very interesting. <clears throat> they used to have vendors. Did they have vendors this year? Um, I don't know. I'll find out this afternoon because oh, okay. I'm going to head there again. Um, uh, also, I met with some folks about an Airbnb in a neighborhood uh, that has... 24 people uh, in one house on septic. Uh, we're going to have that as one of the issues to discuss, <clears throat> how we deal with that. Um, actually, Airbnb only allows the top number of people, 15, and so they've kind of made some adjustments. But people are literally uh, shaving in, and brushing their teeth on the front lawn because there's not enough bathrooms. Uh, this is a big problem. We, we need to protect our neighborhoods. And that is where probably code enforcement comes in. It's kind of a mix between code enforcement and, law and land use. And Paul, I think we need to focus on getting more money into our department to get things done and caught up. 
because this is one issue. The other that I met with some folks, same people by the way, is egg land fill, uh, egg uh, land filling. So near me is agricultural land and I will bet 500 trucks of dirt have been dumped on this site, right by a creek, nothing to protect erosion, something's going on there. I don't know what it is, but we do not regulate that. And uh, there, I had an opportunity to speak to Jim Johnson, who works for the state. He says that this has become a bigger and bigger problem, and the state uh, is is looking at, uh, there are a lot of communities that are starting to look at how they can do that. We can regulate if we desire that. But again, that's another program we'd have to get into. And so I think we really need to start, start talking about how we can give them more help. It's not all the money, it's about finding staff too. Uh, you know, there's a lot of retirements going on uh, and um, Filling those, those positions are tough. Uh, years ago when we were just a booming county and we had to let a lot of people go when the economy slowed down. Um, now there's, uh, we're a booming, economy, a booming county and we can't find the people to fill those spots. So that, and you know, a lot of people left the business and that's also true with home builders. A lot of people left the home, home building business, but we've got to put more money into that. Uh, into those that department to get caught up somehow because I agree you know you got one storage facility another application for another storage facility and unless we start protecting those neighborhoods who knows what will come next so you want to add anything you look like you do well yeah I just want to just say that um, you know every budget season we try to I try to raise this and um, and prepare for it and every early part of the year when we have the presentation about the planning been trying to advocate for it um, I know that the worked with uh, a number of the organizations um, of the map in the map area as far as condensing some of that work so it's simpler um, and there's less load there to make it something that is um, doable versus um, something that's broad and big, but um, uh, the momentum again is refreshing to see that the momentum in Portland and I think possibility of of actually um, uh, merging or using some of those energies um, in a, at a bigger scale because really it's the comp plan, it's the 2040 plan, it's all of that. We talk about all the wonderful things about how Portland is the model for this. But we don't really talk about the negative impacts, and we're not doing anything to address those. And I think people are wising up that we need to take the lead on it. And California is ahead of us. They, 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 they've seen the ills, and they're making adjustments. Um, and the, there's examples out there. We just can't sit back, pretend, and watch. And I think, unfortunately, <clears throat> not necessarily California or us, are not, excuse me, not just Clackamas County uh, and others, but um, we just can't sit by and do nothing uh, when there are examples of where it is working and I a lot to learn. Well, I, I think it's unfair to say we're sitting back and watching it happen to us. Uh, we have a, a national land use planning organization that has picked McLaughlin Boulevard and there will be a bunch of students working being assigned tasks to look at, at McLaughlin Boulevard. We also have a grant application, two grant applications in to Metro, and it, one of them at least is looking very good, and that's the McLaughlin Corridor one. There's also one on, on Park Avenue that looks pretty good too. So we're, we're definitely, the eyes are on this issue, uh, and I don't, <clears throat> I don't think we're sitting back. I think we could move faster, though. I just might, just, just quickly, I mean, if that, if you're talking about the ISO carpet. The ISO carpet focus was on the gentrification and displacement issue, which is the, really the hot issue. I, I'd be saying, that's wonderful. If Metro's focus was on that and, and doing that, that'd be wonderful, but it's not. That's the point. Well, you know, changing the 2040 plan 
Well, I'm not saying we change the 2040 plan. I'm saying that we can change our own, we have ability to change our own codes and, and, um, and accordingly to protect neighborhoods without changing the 2040 plan. That's a broader thing, but to bring a group of people out here to follow the model um, that's apparently having negative consequences for our, our citizens, let alone those in Multnomah County and those in Washington County, um, you know, those are the people that are native to this area are the ones that we ought to be looking out for. I'd say we are. Well, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.